Hi, Nadine. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Thank so you so much, Jane, for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad uh, to have you here today because I know you have understandings of many different like fields in terms of, you know, your academic studies. And also mm -hmm. you write about many other things in terms of intercultural communications and um, cooperations and whatnot. So can you, before we start, introduce yourself for our viewers? Yeah, sure. So my name is Nadine. I'm from Egypt. I'm 23 years old. I live with my mom and my younger sister who brings so much joy to my life. And I also live with two cats who drive me crazy and break everything around the house. And I'm also glad that my maternal grandparents, my Haraboji and Halmani, they live <laughs> close by. Yes, I'm grateful for that as well. And in terms of what I do, as you said, I do so many things that I, I'm not sure if I'm a time management expert or I'm completely insane. I'm not sure what, what the case is. But yeah, so right now I'm doing four main things, like two jobs and two degrees that I'm studying for. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. And you do know a lot about the world. So I was just so impressed because um, I remember you post, uh, you commented something about the three ancient kingdoms of Korea, which mm -hmm. like normally it's difficult to know, right? Like because it was a long time ago and it was very, very detailed um, story from back then. So I was very mm -hmm. impressed about how much oh, you actually you. know and about the Thank metal you. chopsticks and cultural aspect of it. Right. So like mm -hmm. I was wondering how you got to in got into this whole intercultural field. And also, can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your writing and translation project? I, I believe mm -hmm. you have some experience for those too. I so would you yeah. be willing to share? Yeah, of course. Okay, so for the intercultural aspects, I mean, I've always been interested in the world, in different cultures. I loved reading as a kid. I always loved picking up books and reading them. Uh, and like one of my relatives would see me as a 12-year-old reading uh, a novel in English, and, like, and the book would be 500 pages or something. And he'll be like, are you really reading 500 pages? But yeah, and I mean, in Korea in particular, I, I, I started really uh, becoming interested in Korea, like quite recently, in last year, to be specific. And so I pulled up a Google sheet, a, like or a Google Doc, a file. And then whenever I would read something interesting about Korea, I would put it in that file. So that's why the secret that I have, I'm really proud of that file that I made. So for example, um, so the three kingdoms, when I read about them, I put it in there. And then, of course, Joseon and just random things about Korea, really. So, you know, Kim Jong, where you get together and make kimchi or maybe it's nunchi, the emotional intelligence concept or something like that. And just like bits of random facts. But when you put them together in a file, I think mm -hmm. over time, it would help me build a picture of what Korea is. So when I started last year, uh, I was really, it was, I was bored one day and I started watching a Korean drama on Netflix. And I think that's how it all started. You watch one drama and then you start to fall into K-pop and you watch more dramas. But what I like about that is that I became not just interested in, okay, listening to music and watching dramas, but I wanted to learn about Korea as a country. Mm -hmm. So the culture of the country, its history and the people. So I was really interested in that. So I, I just, I, I said I would make it a personal project of mine. I would have this file. I would read about Korea whenever I get a chance and like add information gradually to that file. Yeah, whenever I get a chance. So I'm slowly like collecting these random facts in the hope that they would build an, a bigger picture of what uh, Korea is. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yes. Why not? I, I think it's a very nice way to develop knowledge on, you know, different countries and whatnot. So you have like it, the, the document mm -hmm. gets only more and more detailed, right? Along with the time, because you'll naturally gather exactly. more information. So it's a very, very good thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good habit. Maybe we should learn from you too. So thank you so much for sharing that. Oh. Um, so about no, your writing. Thank you. <laughs> About your writing, uh, yeah, right? my writing. I, I professional. Yeah, I got so focused on Korea on the side too, right? Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, right now I'm a, I'm a writer for a digital newsletter. The newsletter it's targeting the business community, so it gives them like these are the main things you need to know before you start your day. The newsletter is sent to our subscribers early in the morning around 6 a.m. So like you need to know this happened, the government did this, or a business corporation did this, or and whatnot. And we don't really write them in the form of long articles. We just I would like to give our readers a news brief, like short stories. This is what happened. So I write for that newsletter. That's my part-time job. So I write around four stories every day. Um, and in, uh, in this newsletter, uh, I do some translation, but this is not the main aspect of my work. I, I sort of need to translate things to get my main task done. So for example, if I'm uh, uh, reading about a new policy that the EU adopted and I would write about it, maybe the press release that the EU released, it's in French or it's in a, a, another language that one of my colleagues speaks. And I will have to read the press release and then translate it to English uh, because we write the newsletter in English. But So I'm involved with translation, but not directly. I was more involved like with translation directly uh, in my senior year in college. So I was working for our college magazine. It's called Elite. It was a monthly magazine. And every month we publish an, an in-depth interview with one of our alumni, the people who graduated from our college. And because, yeah, we're focused on economics and political science. So many of our alumni went on to become ministers or advisors to, to ministers or maybe even, uh, I don't know, other authorities. So they went on to have important jobs so we got them to uh, for an interview uh to, to, we got them to share their experience and what advice do they have for current students so my part in this i would translate the interview the interview would be conducted in arabic our native language and i would translate it to english and of course i was really following many people one of you among them in the linkedin translator community and i know that what's really common is that you translate into your native language I, yeah, I learned that from you. But what what happened was it, when I was working for the magazine, I would I would translate from English uh, into English, so from my native language Arabic into English. That's what that's what happened. That was the case. I know it's not common, but yeah, it, it, it was really fun. It was challenging too. Uh, the interviews were uh, on average between 1,500 to 2,000 words long. One of them was really long, was 4,000 words. But other than that, they were in the, the range that I said, like maximum 2,000 words. So when I translated, you know, it also took, uh, I, I developed a really strong admiration for professional translators. I'm not a professional translator, but it took, uh, it's not just replacing words as people think, translation is actually a hard job and it involves quite a lot of research too. Uh, because, for example, the, the interviewee would say, uh, I worked for the International Parliamentary Union, but she would say the name in Arabic, and I would have to go check in English, so is it called the International Parliamentary Union, is it the International Union of Parliaments, and like you have to double check these things. So it, it involved a lot of research as well. <laughs> wow, I can really see you're really focused on your job. You you must be a really great, um, not to mention, you know, translator, but also writer or anything you do, really. So like, I can see the enthusiasm, the responsibility, how much energy you are taking into it. So I'm loving it. Um, and you're also very into, you know, you. you are doing these two degrees programs is what you just uh what you shared at the beginning mm -hmm. so two two programs so how mm -hmm. is it working i understand you're um taking the topics of anti-racism and also um sustainable development very seriously um can you share mm -hmm. that part of your life too if that's okay yeah of course i'd love to so for my graduation project like a, a big thesis that i have to write to graduate from college i did that in my senior year so uh i was focused on international relations i was studying political science but then there are different things that you can focus on within political science i focus on international relations and when i was writing my graduation project I didn't want to take like the mainstream topic that everyone discusses, so like conflict or war or trade and so on. I wanted something different. Mm. And that was like in late 2020. So it was shortly after the Black Lives Matter movement mm. uh, in the US. So I asked my advisor who helped me really a lot with this project, if I could talk about race and anti-racism, international relations. And she said, OK, <laughs> let's do it. So I was really happy about that. 
so I started off by arguing that right now many people and international relations itself uh, as a discipline believe that we are in post-racial times so like racism slavery these are things of the past like i don't see color if i see someone from a different race i should pretend that i don't recognize that he's from a different race because we don't see color and the first part of my argument was that i wanted to say no race is still relevant it's still important not because i'm advocating for racism or anything but because if there are a certain group of people who are being discriminated against because they are of a certain race and then i come and tell them no racism doesn't exist i'm denying their suffering i'm denying the discrimination that they're facing so the, that was what i like the first part of my project no race is still a relevant concept in international relations and scholars of international relations should pay attention to race and the second part of my argument i wanted to and also my advisor helped me with that that racism is not only in the form of the traditional a white versus black person it can take many different shapes and colors even with people who an outsider might look and say oh they both look the same I don't know, they're both Asians, for example, so they all look the same, but you, you can find that between these people, they there's racism and discrimination between them, you know, with colonial legacies or different historical legacies. So I just wanted to let people know uh, and make them aware and understand that racism can take different forms. It's not just white versus black, mm -hmm. like to broaden our understanding of the concept. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very important topic indeed. So broadening the understanding, uh, understanding of the racism issue i believe and how we mm -hmm. are able to really um help ourselves uh, so that more people are like not discriminated i mean um it's a very very mm -hmm. important and broad topic too so i am really rooting, rooting for you um so how about sustainable <laughs> sustainable development in africa are you studying on this issue or is it a separate one you are mm -hmm. keeping for another study I am studying, so now I'm doing like the master's in political science, also international relations. That's my main area of specialization. I'm oh. doing that at my home university here, Cairo, at Cairo University. Yeah, it's the oldest university in the country, actually. Uh, but then again, I'm also studying a master's in sustainable development. I'm doing that online with the University of Sussex. So the master's is I studied 100% online and I found that really great because I appreciate the flexibility it offers so I can study for a degree so I might not even be uh, to travel to the UK for uh, like whatever reason for COVID course or for I want to spend time with my family but I can study online so that's really great. So the degree with the University of Sussex, we are focused on sustainable development. And I wanted to do it because, you know, I come from a so-called developing country. So development and sustainable development is a big buzzword. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, and in next month, we're hosting the COP27, so the big climate conference uh, under the UN. Like, it's a big conference. Many different countries will be attending to, to discuss the, uh, the goals and policies for, to, uh, to combat climate change. We're hosting the conference next month. So as I said, everyone's talking about development, climate change. How can we do that? And so I wanted to gain a deeper understanding into this topic. So I wanted to know, OK, what does development exactly mean? How do we do it? Uh, so is it the role of the government? Is it the role of private sectors too, roles of international organizations? Uh, what role, for example, can science and technology help us in development and so on so many different topics this is what i'm currently studying with the university of sussex we take a topic uh, each two or three months or each module that we're studying and we discuss that topic in detail so yeah, it's really quite interesting and you know because sometimes people ask ask me okay so you're studying political science and international relations what brought you to inter uh, to sustainable development and i want to tell them that they're not really that separate i mean there's a focus now in research on what are called interdisciplinary research so research that brings together different fields so uh, political science comes with sociology with economics anthropology mm. and so on and sustainable development is not that really separate from politics as i said because development we have policies we have a role for the government exactly. organizations mm. and also some people yeah if i'm building a major infrastructure project some mm. people are gonna be affected by that whether negatively or positively so that's all politics so it comes into that so i'm not doing something entirely separate i'm hoping that they would be complementary in the future the two degrees that i'm studying sure. 
Sure, sure, definitely. Mm. I can see the connection coming through you too. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> this was absolutely so much fun. And my very last question, oh, thank you. unfortunately, yes, mm -hmm. um, I, like we could go on and on, but I don't want to take up any more of your time because you are a busy woman, I can see. But my very last question, <laughs> It's actually, how do you speak such good mm -hmm. English? I mean, is, is it everybody in Egypt? Oh, really? But I can recognize many people oh. I talk to um, who are from Egypt. They are just perfect in their English. Is it common for you to speak oh, at least a couple languages so mm. perfectly? I wouldn't say it's really common. I mean, we're 100 million people. So, mm. of course, it's not difficult for me to generalize for all Egyptians. But I wouldn't say it's that common. Maybe it's common for a younger generation, mm. uh, but not really for everyone. So, of course, Arabic is our native language. Mm -hmm. And and in school or at school, we study, uh, we study English and we study French. Mm -hmm. But some schools also offer other languages like German uh, or Spanish and Italian. But I think really it also it depends on the type of school you went to. So for example, some people who go to public schools, there's not really that much emphasis on learning the language fluently to speak it. Private schools and international schools offer more help in teaching you the language so that you become more fluent. But I think at the end of the day, regardless of the type of school you went to, like, you know, because it's the education system, and I'm sure it's the case in many other countries, school itself won't teach you to learn the language fluently mm, if you true. don't put in enough effort. Because mm. you, in class, you study, for example, a list of vocabulary or you mm. study grammar rules, but you don't get a chance to practice speaking the language. So you might get like an A or like a 100% score on all your exams. But when you come to speak to someone else, you find yourself like blanking. You can't think of any words to say. Mm -hmm. So I think what really helped me is like, you know, listening to music, growing mm -hmm. up watching Disney Channel. I mean, I grew up watching Disney so and American movies as well. So and reading books, of course, I mentioned that I loved reading. Mm -hmm. So also reading helps you learn new words and so on so i think it's a combination of those so of course we learn the basics at school but you really need to put in a lot more effort you know to learn the language as it's spoken because the textbook might tell you that our oh, people say this but in real life in, in everyday language people don't say this anymore it might be an ancient word or something so it's a lot of you know learn the basics at school but then try to practice a lot more on your own and listen to what the people are actually saying so if you want to learn korean of course use textbooks but i'm assuming that you should watch k-dramas listen to k-pop as well see how the people actually speak the language not just in textbooks sure. that would be my advice yeah That's Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for your advice. It was a very impressive <laughs> Thank interview. You. Thank you so much for your time again. Uh, I wish you all my very you so best. Much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see Thank you, you again. So much. Can I end on one last word? Sure, can, please. Can I end on one last thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, in Anyang, Hanseyong, Anyang means peace, right? Anyang is high. Is that? Anyang is high. Yeah, but isn't the word Anyang itself, does it mean peace or something like that? Peace is Chonghua. Uh, so Anyang, yes, uh, yes. Um, oh. Stay healthy, stay safe, uh, all that put together yeah. in one word. So yes, yes, it contains oh. that meaning. So we, we get to use it yeah, for I both say, uh, saying hi and bye. Anyang yeah, can mean hi or bye. Anyang. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I get it because yeah, when we say assalamu alaikum, our greeting salam mm -hmm. means peace. So I was thinking oh. this might be something that we have in common. So when I say assalamu alaikum, I'm saying I wish you peace Very or may point. peace mm -hmm. be upon you. So I think oh, that's something we have in common. And I know that many Egyptians like now and Arab people are interested in Korean culture. So I hope maybe in the future Koreans can learn about Egyptian and Arab culture as well. That's what oh, I wanted to end with. Yes, 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 definitely, definitely. We would love to know much, much, much more about you. There is just so much I'm to discover. Sure, yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. So thank, thank you. you again. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye.